Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to the MCAS podcast. I'm your host, Matthew Castaneda. Um, we're here back. Thank you for coming on for episode six. And today's guest today is Andrew Cooperwriter, who is the owner of Brood in Lexington, Kentucky, and also a newly declared candidate for Kentucky State Senate in District 12. Andrew, welcome. Welcome out to the show. How are you doing today? Well, hey, thanks for uh, thanks for having me. I'm doing pretty good. I don't uh, it, it's not raining here yet. You know, it's rained just about every day around three o'clock. Yeah, week, it's just so. been a wave of storms all across yeah. the eastern part of the state. But yeah, so um, just, just tell us more about yourself. Like, who is Andrew Cooper writer? Well, um, I grew up actually in northeast Ohio up until I was about like a junior in high school. And then I moved to Lexington, uh, Kentucky here. Um, I'm married, a wonderful wife, Kara, for an amount of time now. Don't ask me how long, three, four years. Uh, and, <laughs> honey, don't listen to this podcast. Uh, and then, um, I have a son, he's nine years old. His name is Leo. Uh, and I, I'm a business owner. I own a couple of businesses. Uh, let's see. I have been involved in politics for a little while. I've, I've been paying attention to politics for a long time. But I've been really heavily involved for uh, just over a year now where I've, I started getting real heavily involved because I was kind of pushed into it. You know, the, the plan in life was to say, hey, you know, I'm going to be a business owner and then I'm going to build up these businesses. And then I'm like 35 and I've got extra time and money. I'm right. going to jump into politics because I'll, you know, because everyone tells you, you got to have money to get into politics, right? That's true. And so I said, that's what I'm going to do. And, you know, um, you know, life had different plans for me, so. Yeah. Right, of course. Yeah. So just tell me more about Brood. I mean, you got an advertising for um for those who aren't watching, he's got the Brood logo um right above his head here. Um yeah. just, just tell me more about the business. Like, did you sure. um did you like start start it with a political message or did you no. start getting political after the lockdowns? No, it's definitely well, so okay. Interesting. So we actually opened the coffee shop uh in 2020. Actually, we uh, we we've been open actually. I think. So you opened during yesterday. I think yesterday was our one year anniversary or no, a month ago was our one year anniversary. So we opened kind of during the lockdowns, kind of not. Right. So what happened was I own a a commercial, I owned a commercial cleaning company uh, and I also owned another restaurant. Okay. Now the commercial cleaning company uh, had, had went from doing, you know, 90,000 a month in billings to five, right. Because nothing was open. There's nothing to clean. And so it's doing terrible, but, you know, it had enough money saved up everything else. And then also I had a restaurant that I'd had for, um, you know, about eight months there, which I opened well before COVID and it was in a small town, but it was the only thing in that small town. So right. that town, Wilmore, Kentucky was the name of the town. It's uh, it's what's called like a bedroom community. I don't know if you've ever heard that term before. Mm, kind of elaborate on that. But uh, no, a bedroom community means that people like they live in the community, but they don't work there. So like, oh, okay, like yeah. a small town that's like thirty minutes outside of a larger town. Or at least oh, okay, so everyone just commutes to like Lexington or to another bigger t- uh, town or city nearby. Right. They don't actually like work uh, in that town, so they could they commute right. to somewhere else. And so, um, because of that, you know, during the day, it didn't have a lot of people there. However, what ended up happening with the shutdowns is all these people are now at home working remotely. Right. And we're the only thing in town that delivers. And we're the only thing other than Chinese food place that's open for carryout. So, right. you know, a lot of people, that restaurant's doing well. So I had a fair amount of savings at the cleaning company. That restaurant's doing well. And I'm looking around. And one of the things I noticed was, you know, coffee shops, bars were closing. So I said, you know, this would be a good time to make maybe a move on this because, you know, I'm an idiot and I'm not expecting the lockdowns to keep going because when they're like, Oh, well, this is just two weeks. Oh, it'll just be a non month or so. I'm like, the spread. yeah, I'm like 15 days. I'm like, Oh, I trust you. Why would you lie to me? Right. <laughs> Little did I know. So, you know, me being an idiot. No, nah, I'm just joking. <laughs> I, I, it, it, based upon the information they are giving, it was a move, right? It was a, it was a move right. that, made sense. And so there's some bars closing, some rest, some, some coffee shops closing. And so this coffee shop brewed, which is a coffee shop. And we do, we serve like beer and stuff. We're open pretty late. Um, it had like everything in it. Right. And the deal I cut there was our rent there would not start until the indoor dining ban lifted. 
Really? So I was able to, I had the property like two, three months, two months before they, you know, and I didn't have to worry about anything until COVID was over. That's the way I'm thinking about it. Right. Right. But when the indoor dining ban lifted, what'd they do? They opened up to 33% capacity. They didn't open up to full capacity. Right. And that's really where things started going, uh, getting rough really quick. And, and, and the reason why is the, going back to the restaurant in Wilmore, you know, it only had 10 tables. So 33% capacity is three tables. And yeah, keeping in mind, it's a bedroom community. People are back at work. So I can't survive just off those three tables at that restaurant. So I ended up having to close that restaurant. And then the commercial cleaning company uh, isn't coming back because either A, people are cleaning so much, they're not bringing back their commercial cleaning companies. Or B, because you know they're just doing it themselves. Or B, there wasn't really um, a whole lot of, of offices in Lexington necessarily that were coming back open. Um, and so because of that, you know, the, the commercial cleaning company wasn't doing great either again. Right. And, you know, and one of the things with the commercial cleaning company and part of the reason why we made the investment is because the commercial cleaning company got approved for a $125,000 EIDL loan. So I was like, oh, we'll be okay. Except- right that money never came hmm. and it still has never come. And that cleaning company actually we had to close. Um, and we had to reshuffle. We were able to reopen and reorganize and we, we still have a commercial cleaning company. It was very small in comparison to what it was doing before. Um, and, you know, and then the lockdowns kept going and going. So we had the restaurant, we got the commercial cleaning company, that we end up having to close, reopen, and is doing very poorly that we're kind of like, okay, we just got to get through this period of COVID, right? Right. And the coffee shop is doing okay-ish. And then, you know, about a week or two before the governor announces he's closing the indoor dining again, you know, the commercial cleaning company, we end up having to, like I said, close it. So we applied for and received government assistance. <laughs> like, so we received like food stamps and things like that. Wow. And it'd come down to the point where it's mainly just me and my wife and like one other person working in this coffee shop because we had a fire lay off everybody. We're just struggling to survive at this point. Yeah. Um, the unemployment system here in Kentucky is completely broken. Um, oh man, you know, I've heard so many stories about it. And the Kentucky one is the worst in the nation. For those who don't realize, we still have 80,000 open unemployment claims from back over a year and a half ago. Um, wow. They have not worked through. I mean, the, this Kentucky was one of the worst unemployed states. He un, There's 4.4 million people that live in Kentucky. He unemployed 1.1 million of them all at once. And so, you know, you've got 25% of the state that filed an unemployment claim all at one time. And so, you know, he announces he's shutting down. And, you know, here's the thing. I don't, I don't have a, a college degree. I'm, I'm, I went to high school. I worked hard. I saved up money and I started my first business and I grew it and I started another business and I was, you know, growing, right? And that's the point. Right. You're growing. That's the American dream to work hard and achieve more. Yeah. And, you know, this is my shot, right? I mean, if, if, if you are someone in my position where I don't have uh, something like a law degree or doctorate or something like that to fall back on, owning a business is my way for financial mobility in uh, in america that yeah, is the way you do it right yeah and so you know and i'd sacrifice someone and this is what people don't understand that don't own businesses you know there's times when we were trying to get the clean coming going where i was sleeping on the floor of my office getting one hour of sleep using a, a roll of paper towels as a pillow because if i had drove in the 15 minutes home it would have cut the amount of sleep i was going to get in half uh, because of the, the 30 minute commute, because I was having to cover cleans because of staff and everything else. And, and so right. it's just an incredible, you know, most people don't even realize that. And so when he came in and closed indoor dining, we said, well, we can't afford to actually push people outside. You know, we don't have a drive through. We don't have something like that. You know, 99% of our business was dine-in, you know, local, co a lot of people don't understand. It's so like coffee is a to-go item. No, it's not. It's not. It is for Starbucks who has a drive through and a tiny little to go area. Yeah. But, but not every not, coffee shop has that luxury. Well, and also too, you know, local coffee shops are gathering places. They're, they're what's called a third place. If you know what that is, but it's a right. place where you, you know, you don't, 
it's not your office and it's not your house, but you can go there to work, gather and be there for long periods of time. Yeah. And, you know, Starbucks is in a third place. It used to be when Starbucks is first open, they were big, they were open, they had a lot of seating. Now they're much smaller because they became into a fast, quick service model. Yeah. But your local coffee shops are completely dine in most of the time. And so, you know, we're 90% dine in. And then he closes it the week of, it was finals week. So, you know, we'd had tons of college studiers out there, which is what we always had a lot of us college students. Yeah. And so, you know, I, it was just, the timing was just so terrible. And so we said, listen, we can't, we can't stay close. So what we're going to do is I got this big bay door. We're going to open it a little bit and we're going to say we're a patio because, it, you know, patio seating was allowed. So I Googled definition of patio and it said something like, you know, a concrete pad with an overhead ceiling. And while our floors are concrete and we have an overhead and I got this door open, right? So I'm like, oh, I'm a patio. Right. Like you um, found, you found the loophole. <laughs> right. That's what I thought. But you know, the health department randomly showed up like four days into this new three week lockdown. And they came in and I had to give you an idea when people first thought we were closed and we weren't, nobody could come in and sit down into the patio area defined as a patio area. Right. We did a hundred dollars of revenue that first day. The second day when the health department came in, well, it was the fourth day of the shutdown because shutdown started on Friday. And then it was Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. So that Monday we did a hundred dollars that Tuesday when they came in, because people started realizing they could still come back. They started realizing it. We'd done like $200 in the first hour, two hours. Wow. And I had like six, seven people sitting in there, you know, getting breakfast, hanging out, eating. And they came in and they're like, these people can't be in here. And I'm like, well, we're a patio, right? If I need to open up this door more, I can, or if I need to open up the other doors, so they go, no, you have to close. You're not allowed to have indoor dining. And knowing what just happened yesterday with when people thought we were only open for it to go, knowing what was going on today, knowing that I just gotten government assistance, you know, a week or two ago, knowing all these things, I, you know, I, I, I was like, I'm not going to be able to come back from this if I close. So I simply looked at them and I was like, no, I'm not going to close an indoor dining. I'm not going to, I'm not going to shoot these people out. I, I need to be a business. I can't look at my kid. I can't look my wife in the eye and say, Hey, sorry, uh, we lost everything we'd, we'd worked for the last several years. I mean, I mean, take my wife. You know, the whole reason why I married her, I was not really the marrying type, but the right. whole reason why I ended up marrying her is because she worked three jobs to pay our bills while I was paying myself nothing to build my first, my first cleaning company business. She would pay herself, uh, uh, she would, sorry, work three, three jobs. One is a, uh, a, a full-time job and then two serving jobs to make right. enough money to pay all of our bills. So I didn't have to pull anything out of the business that I was trying to build because she believed me that much. And we weren't even married. God and so bless. you want me to look at her and you want me to look at my, my son who I have missed things from to build up a business, to build up a better life and say, Hey, I'm going to sacrifice your future. I'm going to give up everything I've sacrificed. Hey honey, sorry. You gave up literally almost a year of your life working more than you'd have to if I just taken a, a normal job instead of trying to build a business. I'm going to give all that up because this lady from the health department has decided that I'm somehow the greatest risk to mankind ever to be around. And the very fact that I would make somebody a cup of coffee is, is going to destroy the world. That's what you want from me. That's government and, officials for you. They don't understand what it's like to own a business. They don't understand they, like how tight of margins built, small business have to work people on. have built nothing with their lives nothing i mean i love it when when i run into this politician that's a lawyer that owns their own law firm that's like them and like five people and they're like i'm a small business owner too i'm like no you're not no you're not no lawyers what are happens if different. you fail you can go work at another law firm you can go get a job as a lawyer elsewhere you've got a jd you know you're you're not going you're not wrecked and if they're like, a politician, they happens. have their pay from their legislative position as well. Well, yeah. I mean, in Kentucky, it's it's like 30K a year. I mean, it's an amount of money, but it's not, you know. But yeah. besides that, you know, these are people saying, you know, I'm a small business owner. I know it's like, no, you don't. You don't know. You don't know. If you've never not paid yourself, risk getting evicted out of your home, 
just to make sure you made payroll to other people, you don't know what it's really like to own a business. You don't. Amen. You haven't been through the same thing. And so, you know, and I don't say that to downplay anybody else's successes in life. So what I, the reason why I'm saying that is, you know, you have, and, and, and you have these people that say, oh, well, you know, we're the experts. So the expert decided the coffee shop needed to close. But you know what? There wasn't a single restaurant owner in that room that they were talking to. It was, in our state, it was our governor and one other person named Dr. Stack, which is like, you know, our state's Fauci, right? Yeah. So you have our governor, Dr. Stack, sitting in a room making decisions. You know how I know? Because under oath, Dr. Stack said that it was him and the governor in a room making value-based decisions based upon what is important enough to continue, what isn't important enough to continue, what because they recognized they couldn't just shut everything down, so they had to have some things open and some things closed and because they didn't value a coffee shops and restaurants, which I would argue led it was the most significant contributing factor to overdose deaths. Well, yeah, they deemed you guys non essential. They deemed us non essential because that's what they decided. Do you think if a restaurant owner, though, was in that room, let's say the governor wasn't a lawyer whose daddy was a governor? And he grew up in the governor's mansion, right? Let's say yeah. that wasn't him. Let's say, let's say he was a restaurant owner before he was a governor. Do you think he would have closed down restaurants? Of course not. I don't think he would have. Not for a second, right? And that's what the point is. That, that, that was the problem with the governor making the decisions. It should have always been kicked over to legislators in all these states to make the decisions. You know, I understand the initial emergency, but this is 16 months. If we can't get our act together... And, and get the legislators start making decisions upon how we're actually going to handle these situations by then. What are we doing? One man doesn't need that much power for 16 months. They shouldn't have that much power, frankly. They shouldn't have that much power. And, and this is why it kicks over to the legislature. This, the Kentucky state legislature is 138 people in the body. Okay, 100 House reps and 38 state senators. Yeah. Those 138 people represent, that's 138 people making the decision, all with different life experiences, all with different constituents all that have different friends that would talk to them, all with different constituents and email them often that they communicate with. And that is how you make a value-based decision. Uh, if, if, if it's going to come down to a value-based decision-making process, which, you know, we can get into the constitutionality of the closing thing too as well, right. if we really want to. But if it's going to come down to a value-based decision-making process, it should be in the legislature where there's 138 people's different values, not in the governor's mansion when there's basically one person and a second guy who he bounces ideas off of. Yeah, make the decisions for the entire state for, like and you said, 4.4 4 and a half million people. Yeah, 4.4 4 million people being made one guy. So, you know, and I know I'm probably speaking to the choir. I know a lot of people out there listening to this are like, yeah, you know, it's the same thing in my state. I hear you, right? I know I'm preaching to the choir, and I know, you know, you can beat, beat that till it's down. But the uh, point is, is, you know, we just stayed open. We were just like, no, we're staying open. Right. And the health departments didn't know what to do because they tried to call the police to close us and police were like, we're not, we're not. Yeah. It. And it's not like they <laughs> wrote up, like written up the whole law about it and the punishments or everything. They were just hoping and praying that everyone would just comply. No well, and that's, and, well, and that's kind of the question too, because there is a law and there isn't a law, right? So yeah. there's a law that says you can't operate a restaurant without a license. And there is a known process and legal standards for what happens when you operate a restaurant without a license. Right. But, there wasn't a known process for a good number of other things, you know? So what, what ended up happening is, is they called the police to close us. Police are like, we don't mess with it. So then they decided, okay, well, we're going to take you to civil court for operating a restaurant without a license. So they took away the license and then took me to court for operating the restaurant without the license. That's the process they were following, but now they have to prove why what? they took the license. Yeah, it's weird. But that's the that's their enforcement process. So, to give you a, an example of why this problem, hold on one second. I was gonna say that's manipulating the the government, well, and that's like and the, that's the thing, right? They only give you a license to take it away. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, one of the philosophies, uh, you know, I encourage a lot of people to to think about hard is if something is legal to give away, but illegal to sell without a license. The license isn't there for your protection. It's there to protect the state. And to That's also it. make money off of it. I mean, right, imagine right. how much they make protect, in revenue from all those it's, licensing it's, fees. It's control, it's tyranny, it's oppression, and then it's also to make money. 
Yeah. It's to feed the state money while also they're not doing it for your safety. If I can cook you a meal, and I love it too. There's this, and not to get off in the weeds, but we're gonna get off in the weeds for a second. No, go for it. There's man. this national legislation that I really like called the Prime Act. It's put forward by Thomas Massey, right? The oh Prime yeah, the dope. <laughs> If 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 you guys do you know what the Prime Act is by chance now have you looked at it at all I've I've read through the bill I've, I've read, read the what bill. it okay. does yeah so it's it's so for those who aren't aware right now I can go buy like a quarter of a cow and it can get processed for me so I can go to a farm and buy a quarter of a cow half a cow or a whole cow and it can get pro this is in Kentucky I, every state's a little bit different right and it can get processed for me and I can get my hamburger and my steaks and whatever right. But if I go to them and I say, you know what? I just want steaks. And then another random guy comes up and says, you know what? I just want hamburger. That's what's called custom processing. And you can only do that in an FDA facility or I'm sorry, yeah. USDA facility. Yeah. And in the USDA facility, you have to have a full-time USDA person at all times there during the processing that the processor has to pay for. So that there's an increased cost to process. And there's also an increased cost then to get the cut simply because I decided I didn't want hamburger and this guy wanted hamburger and I wanted his steaks. Okay. So, right. so there's an example of something that changed. So the prime act adjusts this to say, you know, custom processing. Um, we don't need to do that anymore. Right. And it, and, and this reared its ugly head. And this is why 80% of our, our meat here in America comes from four companies, two of which are owned by foreign companies, one by Brazil, one by China, and then two other companies. Yeah. Um, and this, we saw this with the cyber attack that happened on the Brazilian company that shut down 25% of our meat supply. Yeah. And the reason why they have such a large market share is because of this USDA uh, legislation. You know, it's, it's a, it's an enforcement of the monopoly they have because they're processing such large amounts that the cost is so negated. That's not as expensive as if you're going and And then also too, they're controlling these processors. So you, the farmer can't just like, if you have 20 cows, that's one thing, but if you have like a thousand cows, you're stuck. If you're getting to that much where you're raising a thousand cows, that is the only outfit that can process a thousand cows. That is who you're stuck selling to, and they can buy meat at whatever price they decide they want. Well, yeah, of course. I mean, like with these conglomerates, you know, we have such a huge market share. Any legislation that would, you know, increase competition would scare them. And I'm sure they'd pull out all the stops to to oppose it. Right, right. And that, and that's what the, the Prime Act um, is there to um it increases the free market competition. Yeah, is to get rid of that legislation, right? That's what the Prime Act is for. So, um, you know, and the, and the reason why I bring that up is because I was, I was talking to a legislator or somebody about it. And they're like, yeah, but what about, like, it only takes one bad meat strain then, and then nobody buys the meat here in Kentucky or blah, blah, blah. I'm like, first off, people don't want to get sick. So they're not going to, they're naturally not going to sell bad meat because that's how your business gets destroyed, right? Yeah. But also, as well, um, does the does the USDA inspect your fridge every day? No. So you buy that meat; it can go bad in the fridge. Well, after you've purchased it, and then you eat bad meat that way. Yeah, but and it's already been you know, approved sure that by the USDA happen. and everything. Yeah. Right, and and uh, you know what? I'm sorry, but you know, basic needs of humans: eating, drinking shelter right food water shelter that's the three basic needs right yeah if you don't know how to know what meat wise is good for me to eat okay for me to eat not okay for me to eat that's one of your three basic things you need to survive like you don't need a government agency to tell you shouldn't to tell you like okay now you can't eat that that might kill you like that's one of your three basic needs. Like you should master that, especially you shouldn't, I'm sorry, you shouldn't be able to become an adult and make it in this world. If you don't know what I can eat or can't eat, right. you know what I mean? Like that's basic stuff. And so, and, and that was my point to them about it. And, and you know what? And once again, though, if that same farmer goes out and slaughters that cow and just gives away the meat to whoever wants it, not a problem. But if he wants to sell it, now you need the USDA inspector. So that's, 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 that's what I mean by tyranny. So you take here in Kentucky, you take the health department. They set the license fees. They set the inspection fees. They're the ones who do it. They're the ones who set the standards for it. And then they come in and they say, hey, we are completely unaccountable to any elected body. 
the health departments here in Kentucky are not elected. They're not run by a board that's elected. They're not run by the city council. They're not run by this county uh, judge executive. They're not run by, they're run by a board that was created when the health departments were created with the initial legislation that created the health departments that created a board. Then the board votes on and puts other people on the board as they see fit. And then they vote for their own chair. They are completely unaccountable to wow. any. And so you have an entity because even grocery stores have to get licensed by the health department. So here you have an entity that license everything you eat tells you how much it's going to cost for them to license and provide this wonderful service of licensing that is completely unaccountable to anyone controlling one of your basic needs. And, you know, that's, that's an example of what they were doing during COVID where they're weaponizing those types of groups. And that's what they did. So they weaponized the health departments. And so they weaponized the health department to take away our license. And then, you know, we go to court and the judge ends up ruling that uh, we can't serve or prepare food because of the governor's order. Right. But the governor's order is wrote in such a way that you could still have people come in if uh, people could still come in and sit and they could even eat. You just couldn't prepare them the food. That's how the order was wrote. Right. So a food truck showed up outside my coffee shop and just started selling coffee and food randomly. It just randomly showed up. It was so weird. And uh, just like like clockwork, the day after the judge issues a ruling, all of a sudden this food truck shows up. It's yeah, weird. I mean, it's almost like with New York City, too, when uh, Mayor Bill de Blasio imposed the lockdowns and all the restaurants found specific loopholes in order in order to um kind of like build like almost build up the restaurants again, except on the street. Like, oh, yeah, you can have a set of tables. You can have like a roof and all this other stuff. Basically, having another building or facility without having a building or facility. And it's like, so it, it just doesn't make sense. It's so ridiculous. And it's like, you know what? And that goes into the constitutionality of these closures. Right. So a lot of people like to say, oh, it's unconstitutional for the government to close these businesses. I'd argue it's completely constitutional, but there's a process for it. And it's in our Fifth Amendment taking clause. And it makes it very clear that if you want, you can, the government can take property from their citizens. However, they have to justly compensate them. Mm -hmm. So my argument was if all along while these businesses were being closed, the government should have have to come in and compensate the owners of the companies on top of the staff, whatever revenue they were losing by doing so. And if the government had to do that, I bet you the lockdowns would have lasted maybe a, a day or two at the most to, for them to get a handle. And they would be constantly looking at, okay, how do we open up safely? And they'd be coming into facilities and saying, all right, you need improved ventilation. Um, that's all you need. So here, here, we're going to put in this little improved ventilation for you. And now we're going to let you open and operate fully because we can't keep paying you to stay closed. And then we're going to go to the next restaurant. We're going to look at every situation differently. They come into Brood and they'd say, well, Brood, you got this garage door you got open. So you know what? You have good airflow. So you don't need to close because that's the facts of the of COVID. I mean, there's a reason why there hasn't been a single outbreak on a plane because they circulate their air. Yeah. Right. They circulate. And so, you know, that's a, that's a perfect example of the way they should have handled it, but. And they still mandate masks on planes to this day, <laughs> which is so weird. So weird. And so, sense. you know, so uh food truck show up, they're serving that upsets the health department. They try to hold us in contempt. The judge dismisses the case and he says, nah, they're not in contempt. So the health department in order to stop the embarrassment bleeding of people buying food from a food truck and walking inside, sitting down and eating it, offers to give us back our food permit. We end up taking it back like two or three days before the end of what was supposed to be the lockdowns. But by us staying open, uh, we we inspired and, and worked with a, a group called the Kentucky Restaurant Rescue Coalition. Right. And they put out a... a thing that people signed saying that and, and over a thousand restaurants signed on saying that when this current lockdown order was set to expire if he didn't reopen the restaurants to 50 percent capacity they were going to open anyways and lo and behold because of my case and kind of inspiring them and some precedent set in my case um, they realized very quickly they couldn't afford it they just couldn't afford to keep this lockdown going. So he lifted the lockdown. Right. What, what will be, what would be the record highest case day uh, in Kentucky's <laughs> history announces he's, he's 
opening back up. He didn't lock down again over Christmas. The reason why they locked down over Thanksgiving is because the holiday, but yet they didn't do it over Christmas either. So he opens back up and, you know, we're back 50% capacity. You still got to wear masks, everything else. So a lot of people would be no. done there. I just, I wasn't done yet. And so when I realized, okay, he's leaving me alone. I started working with a lot of other restaurants on staying open, on dealing with masks, because at first they tried to enforce against masks against us too. We got like three violations for masks and we were able to fight those and they dismissed the violations. And then they left us alone about masks. Like they left us alone about masks forever. Like we did not have to quote unquote require masks in our space, like ever after November. (laughs) Um, And the mask mandate wasn't officially lifted until like a month ago. And yeah. so, and the reason why is because they were afraid to enforce against us. We turned into a media storm, terrible crap show for them. And it turned into such, such a crap show like that, that they ended up turning around and saying, I, I don't, I don't want to keep engaging with this guy. If we keep enforcing against him, he's going to keep making us look stupid. Yeah. So, you, you kept being a thorn this side. Right. And they're like, we can't afford this. So they just stopped enforcing against me. So I went on the offensive. I'm like, okay, you want to stop bullying me? Okay. What's step, what's step to it? So I started helping other restaurants out. And then our legislator got into session and I said, you know what? This governor needs to go. I mean, one of the most egregious things he did during this lockdown was he uh, was going to arrest. And the only reason why he didn't was because there was an injunction filed in federal court that stopped him. He was going to arrest people for going to church. So people went to church on Easter. He had KSP, Kentucky State Police, put notices on their car windshields saying that they were going, they needed to self quarantine now for three weeks. And if they took a step outside of their homes, he was going to arrest them. Wow. And that went to federal court and the federal court of course was like, no, you can't be doing that. Yeah. I remember uh, TJ and Chris even uh, mentioned that a couple episodes ago. Right. Right. Yeah. TJ and Chris, they were the, Chris was the attorney on that one. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, that's extremely egregious because it came out that not only, so there's something called good faith. So, and this happens, right? So sometimes you make legislation or you make a ruling as government and it gets ruled to be unconstitutional. Okay. So doing something that it, it turns out to be unconstitutional in and of itself isn't grounds for impeachment, right? Because um, you can say, well, we didn't know you don't, it's kind of like one of those crimes that you don't know it's a crime until after the crime's committed. Like the right. court haven't even decided if it's a crime or not. And so we can't get you in trouble for committing it. And we haven't even decided that's a crime. Right. Right. Um, and, and, and that's okay. Cause you're going to have, we shouldn't have legislators or governors that are afraid to, to do things that because they might be ruled unconstitutional. I mean, you know, we to th- put it on the other side for anybody listening. That's like, of course we do. Well, do you want a case to be heard? Do you want to see a governor make a rule that says something like, let's go crazy out the deep. And I don't know how your listeners feel, but let's say abortions, uh, a governor makes a ruling or a legislator, sorry, passes a law saying abortions aren't allowed in the state. Right. And now that triggers a constitutional crisis that would end up in the Supreme court to say whether or not because, you know, abortions in prior rulings have been ruled constitu- uh, a constitutionally protected thing. Yeah, Roe versus and, Wade. Right. And so if, if you think just because they did something unconstitutional, they should be impeached, that isn't an accurate statement. It's just not, right? But here's why it's different for the governor. One is, is uh, you can't say arresting people for going to church, even on its surface, is good faith. We all know. It's unconstitutional. Like it's the first one. It's the first thing. It's like the first yeah. thing in the constitution. Exactly. It's Peacefully like congregated. freedom, like, freedom of a religion. Peacefully come together. Like yeah. that. It is that thing. Like, like you don't have, you read three sentences in and you've pretty much covered why you can't be doing that. Right. But yeah. on top of that, there's this communication that came out through an ORR that the, um, Chief of police, uh, the chief, the the head supervisor there, Rodney Brewer was his name, of KSP, had had communications with Bashir and was like, "This is clearly a First Amendment rights violation." Yeah, and they're like, "Yeah." So like, he they, knew. I mean, like, he yeah. Knew. So that was the point, right? And how much did he know? Because what we have through the ORR was the KSP supervisor advising his people that 
be careful as you're enforcing this order that says arrest people for going to church because this is clearly a First Amendment rights violation. Yeah. So, so, you know, that isn't a good faith thing, right? So if you said, you know, oh, hey, I am I am breaking the First Amendment and I know it, that's not good faith anymore. You're breaking the law. That is an, that is an established thing. You know it's an established thing and you're, you're breaking it. And so, you know, that was one of the leading things in our impeachment petition. There's several others. We have a... Um, a guideline in our constitution that says you can't make arbitrary laws or state constitution. Um, and you could argue that with most COVID uh, related. Right. Right. And, and that's the thing, like almost every COVID lockdown. And so, you know what, if, if the impeachment committee had had a, a reason or they were really trying to push for, uh, they really wanted to get to the bottom of this, what they would have done is said, you know what? Okay. Let's take that claim. Cause there's 10 claims made in the impeachment petition. So here in Kentucky, we don't have a recall. What we have is the citizens can file a, a impeachment petition and then a impeachment committee can be formed to hear those that those filings. Right. right. Um, and so um, they were hearing those filings. So if I was sitting on that committee, I would at least say, you know what, about the arbitrary claim, I would have at least been like, how did you make these decisions? I want to see the science behind this because, yeah. you know, like, what is this? Because people are crying for that all along. They're like, yeah, what's the tr- science? Trust the we science. science? Yeah. Well, and that's the thing that everybody who was victims of the lockdowns would say, what is the science? Can we see it? What is the thing that you're basing your decision on? We just want that clarity. And so I think that would have been a great opportunity for them to do that. They didn't do it because they just didn't want to impeach him. And they didn't want to impeach him because he's good for fundraising. He's good fodder. Mm-hmm. Um, they didn't want to impeach him because um, they want him to be the one they run against in 23 because they know they'll win against him because he's so hated. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they were like, no, we're going to keep him in for those reasons. Now they didn't say that out loud, but that was the, assumption. it was clear. Like everyone yeah, knew th- th- that was the reason why there's not a good reason not to impeach the governor. I mean, he's arresting people for going to church you had indications it wasn't good faith. You could have definitely dug into the arbitrary notion of it all. You, you, um, as well as, you know, he was found to have violated the constitution like five times in federal court, different times, you know, like you had all the, like, if you can't get impeached for going for arresting people for going to church, what do you get impeached for? Like, I'm just curious. What, what is the, the line we draw? Right. And, and, right. and, you know, the, at the end of the day, the rule is here in Kentucky is what is impeachable and what is not is completely defined by the legislator. It doesn't even matter what's wrote down in law. The legislator could impeach him for sneezing weird if they wanted to. And yeah. so the point is, is they wanted to impeach him. They had good enough reason to. They could have done it. It would have been a political win. They didn't want to because they want to run against him. And they're right. I mean, it will cause more fundraising and it will cause them to win and it will give them more power in 22 election. But the real question is, are they going to be there to enjoy it? I don't know. You know, we'll see what happens. But so we file articles of impeachment. They decline to do it. And but meanwhile, while that's going on, we end up building up quite a good activism network, working with current liberty groups in the state, as well as others. We start upgrading the technology. We start providing uh, you know, texting, emailing platforms, data gathering systems, petition systems to help organize lists, organization, we start putting together protests, court cases running alongside this, um, outside of just the impeachment petitioner, my particular cases, we start helping out with showing things on, we start reporting on things going on in the legislature. I mean, there was one education bill, we got 26,000 phone calls into legislature and on in one day, wow. in one day. So we start getting real active in that. Um, right. But one thing became clear. One is it's, it was very hard in the Senate to get anything to move. There was not enough. You know, the Republicans have a majority in the Senate in the House. But yeah, there was, was just, veto-proof as well, right? It's veto-proof too. Well, it's just a simple majority in Kentucky. Oh, okay. Uh, so gotcha. it is, is to overcome a veto. Well, or a simple 51 vote to overcome a veto in the House. And then, okay. you know, um, 15 vote. In yeah, the they have that and then some. <laughs> They have a what as this as the speaker of the house here in Kentucky called it a super duper majority. Um, yeah. So you know they have seventy five Republicans in the house, and um, they have I believe it is thirty two um, senators in the legislature. Yeah. Um, 
I think. believe it's 32. I'm going to look real quick. But anyways, I believe they have 32 uh, Republicans in the legislature out of the 38 because they have, let's see, one. You sorry, mean the upper chamber? The upper chamber, right, yeah. in the in the Senate there, in the 38. Um, so I believe the Republicans have 32 of them. Um, but anyways, the point is, is that um, they, they, they have majorities. Yeah. I'm sorry. They have 31 of the seats. My bad. Okay. 32. Yeah. I'm way off. Sorry. Off by, off by one. Off by middle. one. But, you know, <laughs> but the point is, is, you know, there's, there's, but there's still not, there's only maybe 10 in the House good liberty legislators and maybe two or three in the Senate. And yeah. if for anybody who knows how it's work, it's just not enough to make great change. And so, um, you know, and, and, and if you want real long lasting change done, like I do in the state of Kentucky, it has to be done in the legislature. A lot of people say, you know, oh, it's in the governor's mansion. We can make change on the governor's mansion. Well, that may make change for four years or eight years, but it's not going to make real long lasting change. And the entire reason why I stood up to begin with was provide a better life for my son. And so if I want to provide a better life for my son, that's going to happen in the legislature. So yeah. I, I, my state senator is, um, has, is a Republican. Alice uh, For Forgy Kerr, right? Alice Forgy Kerr. Now, she, her brother is kind of how she got into office. Her brother uh, ran for governor like five times. Um, but he, he ran in the early 90s. He was the Republican candidate for governor. Right. Um, and she's been in there for a while. I think like since yeah, yeah. 99, so, something like that. Yeah, yeah. So if I unseat her, she will have been in for like 24 uh, uh, years. Wow. Um, she will as long as I've been alive. <laughs> yeah. So she's, she's been in a while. Um, she's been in a while and she is, is, you know, to be quite honest, she is not, um, she is, she is not a very, even, even on the basics of conservative values, like what the party values, she doesn't fall in love. With. Yeah. I mean, which is funny. Cause like I had multiple questions I was going to ask you, you basically kind of like answered all of them at once. So <laughs> you're about to answer this one. That was going to be my next question is like, you know, why her, like, why is she, you know, right. not even, you well, know, one, I, I, I have lived in the district like a decade, but, <laughs> right. but you know, she's been in there a while, but you know, to give you an example, she voted against constitutional carry here in Kentucky. Mm. Um, moms that demand action have spoken very favorably of her. Um, I, I mean, she, um, I'm giving you her highlight reels, right. Of, of what she did. Um, yeah. she came out and, and made a lot of Facebook posts saying she was for the, the, church lockdowns that occurred or at least spoke favorably of them really yeah um she wow. retweeted an article that said you know the gop needs to divorce itself from trumpism with a comment for better or for worse this is me um you know and so which is a bold thing to say when wow. I mean, you're you're basically saying we need to disengage from the last president of the United States, you know, she, she's definitely more in the realm of like Liz Cheney kind of Republicans, oh, yeah. but a, a yeah. lot of people want to call them rhinos or not rhinos. But I, I think, I think the split in the Republican party, and this is, and I think this is the case is you have, this is where the split is in the Republican party. You have Republicans that believe government can, can, is a solve problems and it's a good, and it's a problem solver. And if we just grab control of the, of the wheel, we can use, the power of the government to make good things happen. Yeah. Problem solvers caucus. Right. Types, right. You know? Yeah. And then Tuesday there groups. is the Republicans that view government as uh, a necessary evil. And I know a lot of Liberty people and anarchists would say, you know, government's not necessary at all. And, 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 you know, we can have that argument some other time because I'm more of a minarchist myself. I think there are some key functions that government probably needs to do. Yeah. And because left to their own devices, even if that system was privatized, I, I don't believe we would, it would cost less, save money, or you'd get a better quality service necessarily. Right. Uh, you know, but that's a debate we can have. Um, but, you know, my point is, is that. Although I agree with you, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. Um, <laughs> but the, the point is, is in, 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 you know, on those things, I'm talking about like, like roads. I hear people all the time. They're like, oh, we can privatize roads. I'm like, you know what? We probably could. And there's probably a process to it. And I've heard some solutions on it. And I'm like, okay, that makes sense, you know? But I don't see how it would necessarily cost less or end up being, there's, there's a little bit of a trade-off we have. So the, yes, you would end up with higher quality roads if we privatize our roads, you know? 
Um, you know, and the system I've heard is, you know, like gas stations kind of being in charge of taking care of the roads because they're the ones that collect up fuel tax. I mean, not to get too much into the weeds of it, but maybe, you know, I could see, you know, how privatization could be complicated if you're talking about like interstate highways, you well, know, and ma- that's major highways and roads, like maybe for towns, like for small roads and towns. Well, even like that maybe doesn't make do as that. much sense because, you know, okay, so if I'm Speedway, why would I want to worry about the road that leads to 10 people they're not generating me very much revenues right Right. and so and and i know there's people that are like yelling my roads or whatever at (laughs) at their phone or or whatever right (laughs) and and i hear you and that's a debate to have and i think if we got to a point where you know it is a valuable and worthwhile debate to have that government is is being involved in roads and that is the most important thing we need to debate about at that time, I think the world's a much better place. Um, right. Cause right now we have a government that's doing way more than that. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, the point is, is that they, there are Republicans that view it as a, a good. And I, I just don't, I, I just, I, I know it's a necessary evil, but it's an evil and it needs to get out of people's lives. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and these are the same Republicans though, that have their entire platforms, their entire time that they've been running has been based around an idea that we need to stop the Democrats. That's been their platform. And, yeah. you know, that's just not the platform. Um, you know, they don't have policy goals. And, and that's a big difference, too. We need to get policy goals in there. So, you know, looking at Kerr, she is that conservative in the sense that uh, I, I don't even know how she's conservative anymore. Because you'd say the traditional conservative sense, but at least there you'd have traditional values, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but she, even that, she doesn't necessarily have a whole lot of very traditional values to give you an example of what I mean by that. Yeah. She goes to church, I guess, but you know, she just, and I don't want to talk bad about her necessarily because I don't even know if she's running or not, but you know, her big, her big piece of legislation she did this last session was uh, a conversion therapy bill, which I'm not necessarily against per se. Um, I'm really confused on why government's even getting involved because the bill itself didn't apply to religious people only applied to, um, psychiatric care and things like that, like psychologists, psych, you know, and things like that. Right. And, and what's so confusing is there is already like a, a body of people that work in that industry that license those individuals. And if you have like a complaint on something they're doing, you take it to that body to hear the complaint and then they can say, well, you're no longer allowed to practice this. Right. So I'm confused. And revoke your license. Right. I'm confused on why a bunch of people that aren't experts in this field are making legislation to say what experts in this field can or can't do. Um, that that's a little that was a little confusing to me, you know. But putting that to the side, I'm not saying I have an issue with it, right? And I'm not saying that's not a good bill or a bad bill. What I'm saying is is normally the kinds of people that at least are sitting there saying, Oh, I I, I believe in grabbing the powers of government to do something, normally aren't like normally okay with you know the non-traditional sexual orientations and things like that but right oh she is so it's like okay so if you're for using the powers of government to achieve your goals and you think government needs to regulate guns and regulate people's bodies and regulate you know these types of things and if you think government um and and government needs to make sure that non-traditional sexual orientations and everything else needs to be specially protected and government has a role there. If you believe all those things, and, and like I said, I'm, I'm not saying I come down any certain way on, on, on the, the sexual values thing, you know, I'm right, a liberty right. guy. I just think government should get out of a lot of that. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, normally what I just described, there'd be a Democrat. I, d- I don't, you know, what I just described is a moderate Democrat. Yeah. Not a moderate Republican, even that is a moderate Democrat. That's what that is. And so, you know, and, and it's so much so that I did, I did an interview yesterday for our local paper here, um, the, the Herald leader, and they asked me, they said, are you worried you're too conservative for the district? And, and so it's an acknowledged thing. Everybody acknowledges this. She is not even close to being a real, con, real really conservative person. Right. So much so that they're like, yeah, she's not like that's just an accepted thing. That's not even like an argument. That was gonna be my next question. Like, I don't know if it's because maybe, if anything, if I may make a counter to that, what if a lot of people didn't vote for her in 2018 because she only won by 772 votes in 2018? I think it was about like 
you know, 1.4%. And, right. you know, and even so, like, it's not just at the state level, but Trump barely won the district in 2016 or in, even in 2020. So I, get, I can see why they would ask it if they knew right. that, but no in mainstream media, they don't necessarily do that in good faith. Well, and so, I think, you know. I think it's a fair question, right? But I think one of the things is, is, you know, one of the things we have to remember with Trump when we're looking at Trump mm-hmm. is that, um, and you're looking at Lexington, okay? Moderate people, even moderate conservatives, don't have an issue with most quote unquote extreme conservative ideals. The, the things the left shows is extreme, right? And and right. because my counter to that would be, and, and we can go into 2018 here in a second. And, and plus counter, moderate's a very subjective term as is. Right. And my and my and my counter to a lot of people is has the left been winning in, in Lexington? Their candidates that have won in Lexington, are they milk toast Democrats or are they radical Democrats? And typically they're radical Democrats. They are far left Democrats. You know, I've heard I've heard a Democrat House member from our county say and and you know, so everybody's aware, you know, the seat is held by a Republican right now. And, and the reason why it's a purpley district, um, I've heard a, the, a Democrat from my county, you know, say, oh, every single Republican in my in the house is a racist. And like, I've heard him say that. And I'm like, that's not a moderate thing to say. A yes, I know that's a Democrat racist. talking point, right? But but the Democrats go extremely far to the left with everything they do. No, well, they have DSA types in office, right? And- right. They have zero zero care in the world about how far left they go. And those DSA types, they sympathize with authoritarian leaders like Fidel Castro, like right. And especially right. has been coming to light, you know, over the past week or so. You know, the Cuba protests, right? And you know them trying to really twist the narrative. You know, instead of you know, instead, just point the blame at the United States, not to get too much into weeds of it, but just going off with your point to say that, you know, they're that, oh, it's, the, it's only the right that's radical or they're, you know, they're just far right, you know, white supremacist sympathizers or whatever. And they have to try mm-hmm. to, like, go through a lot of mental gymnastics to try to prove that. But meanwhile, they're openly saying, oh, yeah, we like Fidel Castro. We like, you know, right. people I mean, like the Sandinistas tweeted out you know They're making it obvious yeah they tweet out something favorable about fidel castro like yesterday right so i yeah that's clear they're making it obvious and on top of that too you know when you look at and once again going into looking at the stats and the data when you look at trump there's a lot of people that voted for bernie sanders that then in the general voted for trump yeah, there was a, I think it was like, what, somewhere between like 10 to 15% of Bernie voters, primary voted voters. Voted for Bernie. Trump. And, and and that goes into, I'm going to say something that a lot of people may at first take a brace of, but you need to just take a second. And, Uh-oh, and, trigger warning. And, and <laughs> drink this in. Yeah. Liberty people like me who believe an individual should be free from governmental controls as much as possible. Yeah. And communists, DSA types, socialist communists. We actually agree on what the problem is. We just vastly disagree on the solution. Yep. We both agree that corporate America is a problem. Oh, yeah. But the, pro- the thing that I recognize is that corporate America is only a problem because they're able to grab control of this large overbearing government. And the government enables them to do that. And, the gover- and build up policies and procedures that protect their market share yeah, and even squeeze the out the small guy yeah the Biden administration i think jen basaki and saki in one of her um press conferences she openly admitted like yeah we're working with facebook you know to try to yeah she, uh, she prevent the spread of yesterday. disinformation as they say but it's like it sounds great at first it nice it sounds nice but it's good intentions but they didn't really go into the details of like you know, what constitutes that? Like, what are they defining as that? Like, they're not telling us. Well, it's just not, it's just not government's role. That's not government. Exactly. That's not government's role at all. And so, and that's where, you know, and so we agree on the same stuff. And so when people say, well, you know, do you think you're too far conservative or what have you, right? You know, my pushback on it was my pushback to them a lot of times is, well, first, you know, I think there's, there's a message that's certainly able to come together. You know, there's certainly a message where you can say, if you believe the system is racist, overbearing, and way too in your face, if you believe that, then why would you want to give it more power? Exactly. There's that's a that is actually a message that can bring people together. Yeah. There's messages around things such as um, where you can bring together 
people that they view as all oh, these extremely far right people, blah, 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 right? And the division actually isn't as great as it, as, as it appears. And so one is, is that's a way to, to bring together people. And I think, and, and, and more importantly, it also inspires voters to turn out. Yeah. You know, when you start looking at the voter data for the 12th district, and there is not as big as a gap between, there's always a gap normally, even in far Republican places that go far Republican, there's normally a gap yeah. between Democrat registration and Republican registration. And it's and Republican registration is always lower. Yeah. And, you know, when you look at the data for the 12th district, the gap between Republican and Democrat registration is not far off from a lot of other districts where, you know, Trump was winning by by 60 percent of the vote. Yeah. And, 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 yeah, winning and not to, not to butt in, but I'm like, I'm another one when it comes to electoral data. For those that don't know, um, there's this one particular county in Kentucky that always interested me, which was Elliott County. For and it's like 60,000 Democrats to yeah, 20,000 Republicans. Almost, and it was like, and it was like 80% Republican years. vote. Yeah. Like once yeah. Trump got into office, like he completely flipped. That. I think it was swung by like what, 30 to 40 points. Right. But like the that. registration never changed. No, Republicans, and, like and you that's said, still weird. have like a small plurality. Right, right. And that's what's so weird. So, you, you know, you take a look at these counties and these districts, right? And, and so, while there is a gap in, in course registration, the gap of the county in registration actually isn't as great as a lot of other counties where it's far Republican, right? right. But one of the things is, is you don't have people look at that and they believe, oh, I need to be a middle of the road candidate. And it's like, well, no, actually inspire people to show up and vote for you. That's it's very thing. case by case, you know, right. and I remember and, there's, you know, especially with my previous electoral experience, it's not always about like trying to be middle of the road if there's like a huge voter registration gap. You got to mm -hmm. talk to voters on what issues are most important to them. Right, right. And what is and, and then you look at the Trump issue. Right. And, and at the end of the day, at the end of the day, what I think happened was is, is and this is where Trump shoots himself in the foot. You had twofold. One was what happened in the district for Trump, the 12th Senate district and why it didn't swing his way. One is, is, you know, it is it, right, wrong or indifferent. It is hard to ignore his moral shortcomings mm -hmm. if you're a voter. It's hard to ignore, you know, that he obviously cheated on his wife. That's a thing that's hard to ignore. Like, I, I fully believe if you take – Trump would have a far greater approval ratings if he just simply was, like, appeared to be a moral person, at least in the sense of, like, the way he – his marriages and things like that, right? Well, people see that version of him in Ron DeSantis. Right, right. Someone has Trump's Ron policies, DeSantis. but is much more morally sound. Exactly, so, more so. morally sound. So I think that that part of what hurt, because, you know, you're not surrounded by a bunch of people that are saying, oh, I'm going to vote for Trump loudly. Where it's a purpley area, where it's a little more of a mixed area, you had Republicans being surrounded by Democrats saying, you can't vote for Trump, he's a racist. You can't do this because he's morally whatever. And the problem is, is... You know, Trump didn't do a very good job defending himself, certainly in the racist thing. He did somewhat. Don't get me wrong. Um, and, and you know, Republicans didn't exactly speak up for him in the, in the Fayette County as far as it goes in the district to defend him. Right. Um, but, you know, and I look at the moral things, too, as well, those moral shortcomings, and it made it hard to speak up for him. And so you didn't want to do it. Right. And there's an assumption that, oh, well, it's, you know, Fayette County is very far left and everything else. So one is, is Republicans got to be inspired to speak up, right? Yeah. But the other thing too, and, and I think this is more important, what does the average suburban American right now want? Yeah. And, and I could be way off. I could be way off. But I believe they want to stop this. They don't want to feel like everything's a fight and we're all in this fight for our lives, right? They don't want to feel like they're in the second civil war. They don't want to feel like they're in a culture war. They don't want to feel like that they're in a war over, is this racist? Is this not racist? Is this a problem? Is this not a problem? They don't want to feel that way. And, and to, and the left, when I say that the left would say is, well, that's because they may not want to feel that way, but that's the way it is. And blah, blah, blah. Right. I think the solution to this is to say, and I think this is a, a, a message a lot of people can come around. We just need to get out of each other's lives. And the way I get out of your life is if my choices and my decisions don't affect you the least amount possible. Yeah. And the least amount my decision, and, and if, if we don't have a government that's powerful enough to say, your kids are going to be forced to go to school and we're going to force down a, a, a curriculum on them you may disagree with, like CRT or sexual education, things mm -hmm. like that. Instead, we say, hey, our government's small. 
our government's only going to teach kids math, reading, and simple things like that. We're not going to go into, you know, these values. Or better yet, we're going to have school choice. So whatever you decide values you want your kid to be taught, you can choose to go to a school that chooses those values. You can choose to go to a school that teaches your values, right? If we have that, that's a way we're out of each other's lives, right? Do you want to have a fight at the school board? Do you want to feel like you're, you're, you're in an argument over whether or not your child should be taught CRT on either side of it? Really? Do you really want to? I don't. Do you? No. Who wants to, right? Yeah. That's why, one, that's school choice. Perfect example of why school choice would be great. So that way, if you want your kids taught these values and that matters to you, you have that choice to do that. And there'll be a school for you. And there's going to be a school for people that don't have those values. And now we don't have to fight over what we're teaching our kids because that, exactly. that's, that's how you get some fighting words. And so I think that is a, I think that is a more important message that people can come around is that let's just get out of each other's lives so we can go back to where you don't feel like you're on edge constantly. Yeah. I mean, I mean, and for, and, and of course it could just be because I'm paying greater attention, but when I look at the, the last week, I literally feel like Liberty's in a crisis. You've got last two weeks, you've got yeah. a white house that's saying they're going to go door to door. You've got a, the DNC and other places coming out saying they're going to monitor what you're texting each other on your SMS text messages. And then if I like text somebody, something that needs to be fact checked, they're going to send you like a text with the fact check or the FBI wiretapping Tucker Carlson, you know, or say what you FBI, want about him. But yeah. the fact that there's a whole government agency going after individuals like him is a major concern. Is, well, and then you've got the surgeon general that's flagging Facebook posts for Facebook to take down. You've got, you know, um, that them coming out saying they support local vaccine mandates you're seeing and i know it's coming here in fayette county and and because our state just issued guidance. I mean, it's happening in colleges already when it comes to vaccine mandates. well well our it's hard for our government to require it because there is a law on the books we just passed saying you can't fair enough yeah i mean new jersey we don't have that luxury you don't have that law. <laughs> yeah um but you know when it comes to like the schools um there just became out guidance saying that if kids are unvaccinated in school they need to wear a mask and, you know, the total amount of deaths under 20 in this state is two from COVID. The total amount of school age deaths is one. And that person was so medically off. I don't know if they would have been in school anyways, because they even, had like, even without COVID, even without COVID. Yeah, they were dealing with like cancer and a couple other things. I don't know if they would have been going to school. So one would say schools being closed. There was not a death of kids going to school in Kentucky. That's it's an argument crazy. you can make. It's and crazy yet, because like two of the areas with the lowest number of deaths or two sections are airplanes and schools. And like, yet those are the ones where they're going to be requiring masks the most. Exactly. And there's, and there's been the lowest results, like even before mandates and it, everything. Right. And, and, and so they're going to, they're going to be requiring masks on, you know, like my nine-year-old, I'm, I'm legitimately thinking hard about, putting him in doing private school with him or, or public school. So or not public, homeschooling. Sorry. Right. I don't have money for private school, uh, but, <laughs> but you know, homeschooling him over this masking stuff, because I'm like, my son has asthma, you know, he doesn't need to be, you know, one of the things last year he was wearing a mask and they sent him home once because his mask got soiled or, you know, what? I think it was, as like a little, um, like protest. I would never send him to school with a mask. I'd always make him give him one, but he comes into the car and he's wearing a mask that has a plexi like plastic part around his face. That's solid, clear plastic. So you could like see his mouth, I guess for like, if you're dealing with deaf people or something like that, so mm -hmm. you can read your lips. But I have my son with asthma breathing through a piece of like legitimately plastic over his mouth. And I'm like, this isn't okay. This isn't right. And you've got dentists, child dentists talking about like all the troubles there. And, and so it's arguably, you're not saving anybody. This isn't how we respond when there's the flu. Let's legitimately kills thousands in Kentucky every year of school age children. And it kills like a thousand a year of school age children in Kentucky. This isn't how we respond. Yeah, and yet we have a disease that you could argue zero at the most one of school age children that have died from and and we are saying oh we're going to respond with this extreme crazy vaccination and masking process right. and it used to be the argument was as well it's not about the kids but what if they catch it and give it to their grandma 
Uh, at right, this rate, like Senator Rand Paul, but that said, doesn't stand seems- anymore. Well, now that they're vaccinated, where's that argument at? What What are you talking about? That's not even an argument anymore. And they still have mental gymnastics. Like for example, I went to an NBA game uh, like last month with a friend, and you know everyone was vaccinated. Like you know, I thought there was like a vaccine requirement, or whatever, to go in. I was you know just fully the scholarship. I'm fully vaccinated. So if anything happens, I'm a guinea pig. So I'll let you guys know before. Right. <laughs> you, know, you just for those let that me know when you vac- start turning to a zombie. I just want you to know I'm the first one to put. Yeah, in your I'll let you know. <laughs> like, um, no, no. I mean, I've come out and play. said that if if I was older than sixty five, right? Yeah, but l- l- let me I finish my point. Real quick. L- let me finish my point. Real quick. So with the game, right? You know, I didn't wear a mask because I'm like, and and that was well after Dr. Fauci said specifically said, yeah, if you're fully vaccinated, there is no purpose for you to wear a mask. Like it right. wouldn't, doesn't make any practical sense. So I, I went into you know, into the game, knowing that, like, I mean, I am fully vaccinated. I thought I did my part, as they said. And there was this random lady that, you know, those ladies were like the signs or whatever that says you have to wear a mask. One of them yelled at me saying, hey, hey, you need like you need to wear a mask. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And I had and also on top of that, I had my vaccination card on hand. I showed them like, I'm like, really? I'm like, ma'am, like, I'm fully vaccinated. I should be okay. Like, no, you still have to wear a mask. I'm like, but why? And she's like, oh, no, like, because we're still we're still living in a pandemic. You got to pl- do your part with them. Like, I'm fully vaccinated. She's like, oh, yeah. Like there was eight Yankees players, like eight New York Yankees players that tested positive for COVID, even though they got vaccinated. Yeah. And, and then I didn't want to start an argument with her, but I'm just like, then what's the point of the vaccine? <laughs> right. Well, I mean, what is the point? And then on top of that, like, too, what's so- going on? <laughs> and, and, you know, and that's the thing, too, is, that, you know, I. The fact that you come out and you say, I'm for people choosing whether or not to get vaccinated, they assume you're anti-vax, right? No, like, and what's even more dangerous is that I think the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, one of those major dictionary sources, they redefined what anti-vax was, and they included, oh, if you're opposed to mandates. It doesn't being, make any sense. Right, that yeah. doesn't. And, and saying, hey, you've got a choice doesn't mean I'm against a vaccine. It means, hey, I just think a person should have a choice. I just think... You should have a choice. And I've said it and people will call me anti-vax all the time. And I'm like, listen, I've said it. And I said it a few minutes ago. If I was like 65, 70, I'd get vaccinated. Probably. I would probably get vaccinated right now if I didn't have COVID and they would actually produce it because I'd had COVID. And if they can produce a test of any sort that shows there's a significant benefit for me to getting vaccinated. And, you know, this is a conversation I have with somebody once, you know, I had a heart murmur as a kid. I'm a male. I'm a young male. Um, you know, for those who are unaware, there's this heart inflammation risk that is associated now in specifically young males who've had a history of heart issues right. of if you take the vaccine, getting a heart inflammation, which can lead to death. And, you know, I, I fall into that category of risk. Um, and this was just recently discovered. But more importantly, there is no study saying I get a advantage from being vaccinated. There's no advantage. So, so for me, I'm like, OK, let's say it is one of a million chance you get a negative side effect from getting vaccinated, right? One of a million. Why would I risk that if there's no benefit to me being vaccinated? You know, and that's, that's my stance on it. And and I don't, I don't need to go down. There's no rabbit hole. I need to go down about things, conspiracies about vaccines. And that's not even the point. The point is you should have a choice. Um, And so anyways, um, my point, my point about that is my son wearing a mask. And so, you know, that, that became, this is now going to turn into an argument, just like CRT, the masking is going to be an argument uh, because it deals with our kids and people don't stay quiet when it deals with our kids. And if we all want to get along, we got to get out of each other's lives. And mm-hmm. I think that's something people can come together around. Now, to you, to you data people, we were talking about 2018. There's an interesting occurrence that happened in 2018 worth talking about. Right. First off 2018, unlike this year, we had a, uh, a red president, right? Um, I believe the Republicans had the House and the Senate too as well. And yeah. typically, historically, when you see that situation, uh, the other side always shows up in greater numbers. Oh, yeah. That, that's happened with, you know, no matter who's in office for right. hundreds right. of years. But and also, too, there was this interesting race that occurred in 2018 that Lexington was in the middle of, which was a congressional race between Amy McGrath and Andy, Andy Barr. Barr. Yep. Right. And Amy McGrath ran a really fantastic door knock and getting out the vote campaign, specifically in Lexington, because it was such a, in their minds, a blue area. Yeah. And so, you know, one of the things that you got to look at when you look at 2018 and compare that to 2014 for you data hounds, one thing you got to look at is see an increase in population by 50,000 mm-hmm. on top of a 5% greater voter turnout on top of 
a door knocking campaign read by a congressional district to do a turnout. And what you'll see is Kurt did not change in her vote totals in 2018 compared to 2014. Right. Her competitors did. That's it. Right. That's what you see that changed. Yeah. And so, you know, I would say that if, if, if the turnout, I would say that one, if you run a good ground game of a turnout campaign yourself on top of, on top of, um, putting out a message that inspires Republicans to show up. I think it is a very, very, very winnable district for even a too conservative Republican. Yeah. Uh, for those who missed, I did quotations. Uh, like myself, you know, I think, I think, I think people are less and less identifying with party lines as much too. Um, d- just by slightly, but for those who pay attention in politics, a one or 2% growth of what the middle is, uh, and by the middle, I mean, swing voters, a one or 2% growth of swing voters is a huge growth. Oh yeah. That can decide elections. Right. That can, that is what decides elections, purple district. And I think they're tired of people fighting and they're tired of this just constant berated political attacks and they're they're just tired of it. And they've tried the left with Biden and they're seeing it got worse, not better. I think they're going to try the right this next time around. That's just my yeah. opinion. Um, and so, you know, that's my views on, on, you know, the winnability of the district, uh, you know, obviously the, the primary is a fight too. You've got an entrenched person, but you know, we'll see how that turns out. Right. And, and yeah. we got to win the primary first. Um, we're hoping if we show a, a good amount of fundraising that people will see that not only are we a very viable candidate, but also as well, it'll help possibly clear the field in the primary election where, right. you know, people are like, eh, it's going to be a fight. This guy's got, you know, a hundred thousand raised already. We don't want to do it. And so one is, is we need people. So to, for your listeners to donate, you can donate to in, in, into a state race in Kentucky. And if you're not in Kentucky or if you're not in the district and, and for those guys, you can go to. Cooper Rider, shameless plug. Cooper Rider, that's spelled C O O P E R R I D E R. C O O P E R R I D E R. Yeah. The number four, KY.com. So Cooper Rider 4KY.com. And you can check out my policy positions and everything else. There's some fun Easter eggs in there. Um, you know, I, I encourage you, it's it's fun. You can check out my abortion position, uh, which a lot of people, which was labeled the most controversial and extreme abortion. Uh, um, position any Republican ever running for state Senate has ever had. I was, I, uh, a group here called me the most misogynistic anti-government and extremist candidate ever. And they were highlighting my abortion position, um, which it, have you seen what it is? No, uh, no, I I've heard stuff about it, but I haven't seen have, it. Have you heard about it? If you, I encourage people go to the website, Kubernetes 4 ky and just click abortion and it's a, it's apparently it's the most radical abortion stance ever. So yeah, you'd have to, you'd have to check it out. Right. That's a little oh, teaser Lord. to get people to check it out. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but you know, I think, I think it's a, a definitely a winnable race as far as that goes. No. Awesome. Yeah. And I'm very excited to hear about your candidacy. And I know a lot of people that'd be more than happy to support your campaign. I mean, we got a lot of good people in Kentucky, including, um, including Autumn that, you know, it's my girlfriend, and everything, you know, TJ, Chris Wiest. Um, but again, Andrew, this was, this was awesome. This was great. I, I learned so much. Um, you, know, you seem to know the district very well and, you know, just God bless you just for going through so much, you know, especially since the pandemic began, it's I can only imagine how difficult it was for you really. And, you know, just to, the fact that, you know, this, I can still see you come out on top is it, just incredible to say the least. So, you know, yeah, I, I really, you know, I really pray rough. for you. Like, I really <laughs> hope that, you know, things go well in the upcoming election, everything, but um, yeah, you know, I mean, we're starting to wrap things up. So um, if you wanted to give like any last thoughts or. Yeah. Anything. I mean, I, the, the biggest thing is, is for anybody out there, Liberty people, and, and this is what's fun when it comes to donations, you know, and this is just kind of a, a, a plug to just in general, give money to candidates. Okay. Right. <laughs> um, how many people ask yourself this? How many people have you said that think it's time for an armed rebellion or they're going to get to an armed rebellion. Right. Right. Or I'll see people, I, I don't know about you guys, but I'll see people show up to rallies and they've got, you know, a, a $500 ballistic cap and they've got a, a $300 plate carrier with a $500 level four plates in it. 
They're carrying a two thousand dollar rifle with a custom airbrushing, you right. know, and they're and 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 so all in all, you know, they're showing up to these. They got a a thousand fifteen hundred dollar Kimber specialized handgun on their side, right? So they're showing up with ten thousand dollars worth of uh, weapons and equipment, and they're like, you know, it's time for rebellion, and it's all whatever. And then you look at their donation report, and they've given zero dollars ever. And so it's if if ask yourself this: Have you donated to a political candidate? Have you knocked doors for a political candidate you believe in? Have you done these things? And if you've never done those things and done them significantly, not only a you're not going to convince me you're ready to have what it takes for an armed revolution. If you can't even give ten dollars to a candidate you believe in, you're you know I don't think you're going to be there for us in the revolution. Just yeah, crazy, exactly. right? But also at the same time, um, it's not time yet. That's not the time, right? Until we have, um, you know, only 3% of Americans donate to political candidates. So until the other 97% are donating and getting involved and doing those types of things, it's not time yet. People say all the time, they don't listen to the will of the people. You don't get them elected. 3% of Americans get them elected because they're the ones giving them the money. That's how they see it. Yeah, exactly. The other 97%, they don't see you as the ones who get them elected. So of course they're not going to listen to you. So yeah. start being the people who get people elected. And you do that by donating to candidates, volunteering on campaigns and helping out. You know, that's just a, a yeah. little bit. No, hundred percent preach. Yeah. I, I was someone who knocked doors myself on two uh, different sets of campaigns in New Hampshire, and Wisconsin last year. And, you know, that was by far the most work I've ever done. Those combined like two and a half, three months, but you know, so I really attest to that and I 100% agree. But again, Andrew, uh, thank you so much for coming on. This was, thank this you was, for having again, me. This was, of course, this, this was great. You know, hope to have more cans on like yourself soon and uh, best of luck with your candidacy. Really well, looking forward you. to see how it goes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Awesome. Right. Thank you everyone for coming on to the podcast. Um, my link tree, my social media links are down below. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, you name it. I also have, a, you know, I also have a link tree in the description box. Um, again, thank you guys so much for coming on and uh, hope to see you all next time. All right. Have a good one.